So I'm Sarah, um, I'm the CEO at Red Ant. We are a um, app development company. So we started off, we used to be based in Maidstone, we're now based in London, so that's the link. So um, when Becky said her first line manager was here, I'm that, that person. So Becky and I work together in marketing. Um, as Louise was saying, as Becky's saying, it's something I fell into. I thought I wanted to do sales because I quite like the relationship element. But after going for a couple of interviews and even getting the jobs, I was like, I'm not really sure that this is what I want to do because it's quite pressured and I think you have to be, it's pressure in a different way about targets. Um, I um, worked with Becky in marketing and it, as we said, it was sort of stuffing um, mail shots into envelopes, but it was quite exciting that yeah, fast pace. Too. Yeah. <laughs> and you're given a lot of responsibility as well as a client manager, even as an exec, you're, you might be working with a client director or, or even an account manager, but you're still exposed to the client, which uh, gives you a lot of experience quite early on. Um, I moved through a couple of, um, I went from there to work in Tunbridge Wells for a while, so I kept it quite local. Um, and then one day I applied for a job in Dubai, which I got. So I spent a couple of years in Dubai. So it does, this type of job in advertising marketing does give you the skills that people want abroad, whether that's Australia, whether that's Dubai, um, et cetera. Might not be Europe, um, but we'll see. Um, and then when I came home, I was looking for a company. I'd worked for large. I'd worked for a really large agency in Dubai, um, but my agencies I'd worked for here had been quite small, and I really wanted to go back to something that was quite um, family feeling. Um, so I joined an agency that used to be based in Maidstone, and had worked my way up through being, from being a, an account director to running the business day to day. And I think that's another example of how, if you're that people person looking after the clients, how that can also, your trajectory can change and grow depending on what you, what you enjoy. Um, so what I'm gonna to talk to you about, obviously, about is really about the measurement, but this is partly why I think client management is so important. So you actually become what I like to call the people glue. So you're the person in the whole team. So you asked earlier, do you work in teams? It's very unusual that unless it's a one man band, you will, won't work with more than a couple of different type of skill sets. So you're really the person pulling that all together. So you're interfacing with the client, but you're also making sure internally that they, everyone's done what they need to do. So you're sort of the super organizer of the group. Um, you represent the, um, you know, client internally and externally so you're the one that will go to the meetings with them but internally if you feel something isn't really going in the way that it should do for the client you're the person that speaks up about that so you have quite a lot of responsibility um, you have exposure to client businesses so one of the clients I currently work with is IKEA so quite often we're in the IKEA office you can see what's going in you know that obviously they've made TV shows about how they work day to day but you really do get to experience other types of business and I think, um, you know, there's merits to working clients, so, but the great thing about agency life is you get to look at a snapshot of loads of different businesses, so it's never boring, and you really get to sort of have a nose about what's going on. Um, as I said, there's lots of different avenues, so you can progress within the agency all the way through if that's what you want to do. Um, you can go and work in a client business, so a lot of the time because of the nature of how you become quite multi-skilled in an agency, clients really like that. So a lot of the, a lot of my friends have gone from working agency side to working on the client side. So they've had that variety and then gone to head up Andrex for the UK, etc. So it's sort of big chunky roles that, that, but because they've had a good variety of experience, they've moved over. Um, or people like Becky have gone on to set their, up their own businesses. So I think the nature of being exposed to lots of bit different businesses is you can say, well, I like this, or maybe you work for an agency that, that they're not all great. You know, maybe you've worked for one that isn't doing it right. And you think, I'd like to do this, um, but I'm going to add this element. I met a lady on Friday who had worked in lots of different tech companies and she thought what was missing was kindness. So her, she's now set up a business that they invented Oyster cards, but her main aim was that everything she did, she was going to do it with kindness. She just felt it was a bit of a mean industry. So it can be a really thin slither, but it's sometimes people want to set up their own business so they can do it their own way. So how do you assess impact? So I think sometimes when you're looking at results, some it, people can think that it's quite a pigeonholed um, 
exercise so you have to be really good at maths and analytics and stats and if I don't understand that I'm never going to be able to you know I leave that to someone else in the team but actually I'd like to put forward the case that you need to have a little bit of each of these skills so you need to be a little bit creative um, maths is important um, but I think you can teach yourself the type of maths you need but also science is create is important because bringing all three of those together and I explain why I think gives you that perfect um, suite of different skills that you need to really understand what's going on behind the website once you spent all that like blood and sweat and tears building it so creative so lateral thinking what do you think is the I well it might not be statistically but what do you think could be considered the number one biggest mistake that people make when they build a website no okay so <laughs> yeah that can be yeah yeah and I think that's sort of part of it it's you don't test it so not test it functionally but you just put the website up and you just leave it and you're like, oh, I've done that project, I'll move on to the next one. And that actually, one, as a client manager, isn't gonna feed you that next piece of work you need, but you could get a nasty surprise in six months when the client says, no one's come to our website, it's not performing. So what I would say is you need to be creative early on. So you need to use insight, so demographics. So is the website for, um, the person who goes shopping every you know is it a laundry detergent do you need to appeal to that person who's just nipping into the shop and needs to buy something are you trying to appeal to a younger demographic like yourselves like have you done that homework and really feeds into what louise and those guys do have have you done your homework to understand how you know the actual demographic is going to interact with you what the motivations are mm -hmm. and i think it shouldn't be i think what tends to happen is uh, creative sits in the creative team and the client managers do this I think brainstorm as a team and I think it was the other question about a team there needs to be fluidity for you to you might get an idea from someone a creative idea from the developer who just is doing quite a menial task all day but he's dying to share something with you so I think it's really important to do that um, push boundaries and I think this goes across anything you do ask questions and then ask again I think there's no harm in asking a question. Even if I guarantee you, if you think it's a silly question, probably about three other people in the room want to ask that question, but they haven't quite got the courage to put their hand up. So keep asking questions, especially if the brief is something that you feel you understand. Maybe it's you know shopping and top shop, and you say this isn't, this isn't how we shop anymore. Like put your hand up and ask the question and keep challenging, um, and think about how you're going to once you've. Um, gathered all this information the insight how are you going to display it a lot of people are visual so is it in a bar chart is it in a pie chart how are you going to translate what you find out to other people so you can take them on the journey with you uh, so as I said maths does come in there um, a lot of the programs will do this for you but I think there's the analytical skills um, so the most common KPIs asso associated are visits to site so a bounce rate is when someone goes to the website, but you can tell by their interaction they didn't really mean to be there. So, or a, a bad bounce rate is if they get to the website and it, it's so um, content heavy, it doesn't load. So you know there's something with what's happening. Uh, number of sales related items. So you start to build up a picture of what you can see is going on. Um, and modeling, um, there's in terms of return on investment, attribution so does every time someone comes to your website have they always been to Facebook before what are the key drivers to um, how they go through other sites before maybe they buy something or sign up for something and really live and breathe those top 10 stats so have a master spreadsheet so that when you go into a meeting you're able to say to the more senior guys or the client right we we had uh, we're up 10 percent in our visits last week since we put the facebook campaign live really really live and breathe that information because yes it's about keeping the client happy but you really need to understand where you are in terms of how your journey is going in terms of performance so science um, so quality of research, so it's not just about crunching, but people's experience as well. Um, so a lot of the really great like nuggets of insight you get are by talking to people. So use the example of IKEA earlier. 
um, we developed a series of apps and we could see everyone was using them. Um, and then we get sort of a peak up and down. And when we went in to speak to them, there was an element in the journey that hadn't quite been ironed out in the original creative stage. But we only knew that through to talking to people. So we didn't know that through the stats, knew there was potentially a problem. But actually by talking to people, we found that out in a couple of other elements. And also the flip side of is if people, a lot of the time people are piloting these days. So they're looking for support with adoption of their you know, key project internally as the client. A lot of the time you can get those nuggets of information that help you enable the client to sell it into their stakeholders. Um, so, you know, what improvements could be made? Um, what are the three stop shops you most visit? It's just sort of really, as I said, keep asking the questions to really understand who you're working with. Um, An experiment. Um, as I said, with the number one biggest mistake is just putting the website live and leaving it. Um, I think push for, push for a pilot. More and more clients, because they're wary about how they're spending, spending their budgets because of the current economic clients. People softly, softly. So I think don't it's, don't feel uncomfortable with the fact something's a small test. Often you can improve it in that time in between. Um, a B testing. So that's where you have normally it's creative based, but where you have one set of creative and another set of creative, and you test them against each other. So during that pilot, rather than putting all your eggs in one basket and saying this is the absolute final creative, you might test two different creatives and see how people react to it. Um, check in, as I said, like normally you will have a level of what's generally these days called hyper care. So you will be, as a client person, you'll be talking to the client a lot in that launch period. And it'll probably be on day one. So on launch day, you might have three different calls. Um, week one, you have check and can try to weave into your thinking is about constantly updating the client because the worst thing is to not see something coming and if you sort of leave it and say this is great we've moved from one site to the other and there's been no issues that, that normally invariably there's something that comes up that you maybe haven't thought of um, multiple variants so looking at different ways to test that and I think sometimes it's important to ask the question, what if we did nothing? So if you switched off everything that the campaign had been built to do, what would happen if you did nothing? And that helps you to understand what is your best push to the site, um, whether the um, promo you're using to get people to, you know, part with their email is working, like turning things on and off and sometimes doing nothing really gives you a, um, a backup for understanding what you're doing. Um, and sharing results with clients. So it's all very well having them for yourself, um, but aren't really ask the questions to the client, like what impact is it having? How is it being received internally? What data have they collected? Sometimes it is a little bit, it, I'm gonna be honest with you, it's difficult to sometimes to get this information out of clients because there's sometimes reasons why they can't share it. But don't be afraid to say, have you seen you know, an increase in sales? What's the feedback from the sales team? Sometimes in marketing, sales can be the tricky, although they should work hand in hand, sometimes there's a bit of competition Competition. So it's really trying to find out what the um, what the perception is internally because if it isn't great for whatever reason it might be something that's nothing to do with your website but because they weren't briefed properly it's knowing that as soon as possible um, it, as I said it's important to check in on your performance and also don't be afraid to say what, you know what's not going so well because I think that is the that when the contract get can if it got cancelled that will be the reason that you didn't ask and I think it's just you know, of course you want to talk about the positives, but also scrape a di bit deeper and say what's not going so well. That's it. Any questions? So measuring impact, so obviously I know it's quite, it can be quite difficult. Yeah. But how do you go around, so obviously with clients that don't fully understand, how mm. do you Yeah. It doesn't have that technology. Yeah. So I think there's there's two levels to it. Um, over the years, we've introduced more onboarding at the start. Uh, so I make sure the other guy, like the rest of the team, sit down the client to start with and say, look, this is how we work. Because it's also about how you work. 
um, and say, we'll be checking in with you every two weeks. Like years ago, it used to be take the brief and the the criticism of agencies was that they'd take your money and you wouldn't hear from them for a month. But we get them in quite quickly and say, this is how we work. We're going to do a check in. And I think and, and we more often than not have a glossary at the end of that presentation that says we're going to start to use some language. We work in what's called an agile way. So we sort of explain about that. That's how we work day to day. But we'd also if we feared from sort of the initial meetings, there was a lack of understanding about any element around clicks or how a certain platform works we'd include it there um, we'd also um, weave that in we have uh, every week we have a status meeting so more generally that's a face-to-face -face and then a phone call like alternate weeks and that um, that will cover all the different work streams we're working on but we'll specifically have a stats um, point to talk about so we're sharing that each week and I think to your question if they didn't understand that you because you are talking to them so often you would quite quickly work that out you'd hope yeah, yeah. Quite, quite a lot of my job is going in to like board meetings and presenting to people who don't understand the stats so it's where marketers can't internally explain why this is beneficial to their company so I'll go in and break it down for people who are marketers mm. and explain the stats for them basically and I think one of the reasons that I chose to I suppose craft the presentation like I did is I think and we how we spoke about it earlier and Louise made really clear is there's no one clear path I think if you like being organized if you like people there's something for everyone in client management and it is very re rewarding um, as I say go, going into Christmas party yeah. season yeah. now um, but it allows you to travel like I said I was able to live abroad for two years based on the fact I had you know at that point probably four years client management experience and th then actually going somewhere like the Middle East because the UK is slightly ahead in some of those things you can actually really rocket your career doing something like that because you have the skills that they want. Any Yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, so my clients now range from anything from like fintech startups to I've got a water softener company as one of my clients, property companies. Um, they don't expect you to be an expert in their industry. It's not something scary um, to go in and ask them questions because ultimately their clients aren't experts in their industry either most of the time. So if we don't understand what they do, their customers aren't going to either. Um, we're brought in for our expertise in building websites, human behaviour. So by we can try and become part of their team, especially where it's complex as a product. We'll go and sit in their offices for a week, really understand what they do and work with them to explain what it is. Um, I think I find it fascinating going into companies where it's an industry I don't know. Mm, mm. Um, but yeah, I've got like payment providers and all sorts nowadays. Mm. I think. It, it, yeah, <laughs> but everyone has a mattress. Hopefully, yeah. Um, I think the hard. I think the biggest piece of advice is to do your homework, even if you think you know. Like even like we have quite a few makeup brands. Like I know I know how to use makeup, but I think I always say to the guys, you need to go in and have a consultation or try some of that makeup. You can expense it, and I think it's put like I had two clients at the same time. One was Volvo. Never driven a Volvo but I have driven lots of Volvos now and that was the point like the client that was the client recognized that was important they would let us borrow the car for the weekend so I think that I mean that's an extreme example in Dubai that's how it is there but uh, the other one was IBM like it was about servers and you know products but by doing a lot of reading and by reading the material I was helping the client to produce I, I st started to know a lot about that and actually even the probably the driest of clients because you will have a dry client as well as an Ikea normally at the same time you just need to sort of immerse yourself and any good client will help you do that and want you to do it because it's in their interest as well and also from like a relationship point of view the more you know them the harder it is for them to leave you because they'll have to start that learning process over again so if you can understand them as a client really well almost no more than their marketing team do in terms of their product 
um, you you are so valuable to them as a company and as mm. an agency um, because you think about it in different ways to them. Mm. And it's almost like becoming their friend, isn't it? So that they feel like it's yeah. like, and it's an actual um, friendship like, rather than a business relationship. Yeah, they can bounce ideas off you that they might be embarrassed to talk about internally because there's no judgment in an agency. Like we're all we're always up for new ideas. Whereas they might not want to bounce that idea off their board meeting, mm. um, but they'll come to us to ask us what we think first. Yeah, and I think the first job I had where I worked with Becky, uh, the guy we worked with said, you know, your number one thing is to make friends with the client. You need to know how many kids they've got. You need to know this. And that is really good advice because it's hard for them then to sort of, if something goes wrong, it's harder for them to yeah. tell you off. <laughs> However, my advice also is, it's also if you've met, if you become too friendly with a client, you've also sometimes got to tell them no, and that's really difficult. So it is some, it is you've got to find that balance, yeah. But it most of the time it works more in your favour to to know them inside yeah. out. Just out of curiosity, when do you have to say no? Can you give an example? When do you have to say no? Um, Unrealistic deadlines. Okay. Um, I want the world with ten pounds. Mm -hmm. Unrealistic <laughs> 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 expectations. Um, and when sometimes the um, client will believe they've got the design head and that they believe that their design is better than our designers, mm. and that's quite a difficult one to actually say, mm, that's not going to work, that's not yeah. the best way to do it. Yeah. What I find difficult, because uh, like Louise, is my, I previously was doing obviously paper based or postcards, and it's a big mistake, obviously, if you print a um, postcard and it's got the wrong phone number on which is a classic that a lot of people have done but with digit but you know roughly how long you know you say right the creative team have got five days to do this then the copywriter's got two to do that and then you send it off to print you're done with digital most digital work the way that software development or any type of development works is that they'll give you a rough estimate but it's really difficult to estimate. So you might have, where I think the hard, if you're, if you're really passionate about client management, if you say it's gonna be done on Thursday, it has to be done on Thursday. It's much harder in digital to make sure that happens on Thursday. So you have to start building in buffers. Otherwise you're saying no because, or it's not ready when it's completely out of your control. Um, and I think it sometimes is a timing thing because it's a much harder element to estimate. Even developers who've been doing it for years, they'll hit a certain blocker. And um, so I think sometimes that's when you have to say, no, you can't have it. And that's heartbreaking as a client person because basically you're a people pleaser uh, and you want to keep the client happy and sometimes you can't. Yeah. Really sorry, but yeah. Yeah. And that like extends out into the team. You need that developer to tell you in the morning. I know we're going to do that today. And that also comes with their experience. Sometimes they put their head in the sand. They say, Yeah, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Most of the time, you know, you've built in enough time. But sometimes you want it is the eleventh hour, or you have to say, Guys, look. Sometimes there's a media deadline attached. So maybe they've got television going live and you say we're gonna, just going to have to sit here until this is done very rarely that happens but sometimes you have to that's when you have to pull out the stops because there's lots of other domino effects of you saying no yeah I'd say technical restrictions explaining mm. technical restrictions is the, probably the hardest part mm. for non-technical clients uh, they're on a specific system but they've done something else somewhere else and they're like well why can't it be done in two minutes so not quite that easy. Yeah, and also you can be the victim of your own success because if you always say yes to it and you're like absolutely smashing it from a client management, then when you say no, it's even more damning to them because you haven't said no before. How do you find your hours are? So something we do in Reflect Digital is we charge a tariff for the hour. And we include account management in that, but quite often we feel that we're running over that time or we're just having to do stuff kind of as it comes in because we can't we can't charge for the we can charge for like the development the design yeah. but account management is quite difficult isn't it yes um i think that it, I think it comes down to personality. I've got two different uh, account directors that work for me. One of them is like has the best relationship, but she says to the client, "No, I've spent that time. You know, 
I need to charge you for it. The other one really gets on with the client, but really has trouble um, putting into words why she needs to charge for it. So I, I think it's always going to be a problem with account management. But I think, again, it's in that onboarding meeting. It's really setting the guidelines for most people have a pot of money that you can use for day to day. And it's saying if you ring six times a day, your pot is going to go down and down. So it is about management expectation. I think that's the sort of that's the, the whole role can be. It's really about managing someone's expectations. And the more you remind them of that, obviously, in the right way, the easier it is to sometimes charge for those things. But I also think because it's a, like any relationship is a bit of give and take. So we had an innovation project that because a provider couldn't supply what we needed, we've had to sort of close down for now until Visa or PayPal or someone can catch up. And we had a pot of money that really it's sort of a, a use it or lose it, but we've got a much bigger project with them. So I said to the guys, just say, we want to be paid for the invoice that's current, but the hours will roll over for you. And I think sometimes you can't, you have to pick and choose your fights. It's like any element.